Hey everyone, this lesson is on the infectious disease known as Q fever. In this lesson, we're going to talk about what this condition is. We're also going to talk about how it can be transmitted, what are some of the risk factors. We're also going to talk about signs and symptoms, how we can diagnose it, and how we can treat it. So Q fever, Q really means query. It is a query fever. It is a very rare and interesting condition that is quite variable in its clinical presentation. It is a zoonotic illness due to infection by the gram-negative bacteria known as Coxiella burnetti. Coxiella burnetti is an intracellular pleomorphic rod, and it is in the classification known as proteobacteria. Transmission of this bacteria can occur as follows. So Coxiella burnetti is a bacteria that infects cows, goats, and sheep, but it can infect other animals and humans via inhalation and ingestion of spores of the bacteria or via a tick bite. So the tick can carry the bacteria as well and then infect an individual with the Coxiella burnetti. Also, ingestion of raw milk and or goat cheese may infect individuals as well. In certain instances, an individual who is pregnant who has infection of Coxiella burnetti can actually pass it on through vertical transmission to their offspring. So a vertical transmission from mother to infant can also occur. And interestingly, this bacteria is worldwide and it is worldwide except for New Zealand. So New Zealand does not appear to be affected by Q fever or Coxiella burnetti. Now some of the influencing factors for the presentation of Q fever are as follows. Age is a big one. Age can change the clinical presentation of Q fever. In older adults, older adults are more likely to be symptomatic with Q fever than younger adults. So younger adults may not even have symptoms. Gender can also influence the clinical presentation of Q fever. So men are more likely to be symptomatic than women. And interestingly, pregnant women are least likely to be symptomatic. And another influencing factor for the clinical presentation of Q fever is geographic location. So some symptoms are more likely to occur in different geographic areas. So some areas of the world, hepatitis is more common. And in other parts of the world, pneumonia is a more common clinical presentation. We'll talk a bit more about that in the next couple of slides. So what are some of the risk factors of Q fever? Some of the risk factors for getting Q fever are the following. Exposure to endemic areas. So this makes sense. If you're in an area with a lot of Coxiella burnetti, you're more likely to be infected by it. Farm animal contact. We mentioned that cows, goats, and sheep are often reservoirs for this bacteria. So if you have contact with farm animals, you want to make sure you wash your hands properly. And again, especially sheep, goats, and cows. Proximity to contaminated farms. So even if you're not in direct contact with the farm animals themselves, if you are downwind from a contaminated farm, you may actually become infected with this, even just through inhalation of the spores. Abattoir workers are also at higher risk for Q fever and veterinarians, so individuals that are exposed to animals in general. And interestingly, there has even been cases where healthcare workers who are exposed to humans who are infected with this can also become infected with Q fever as well. So what is the pathogenesis of Q fever? The pathogenesis is as follows. The bacteria survive as a spore-like structure in the environment, allowing it to survive for prolonged periods of time. And oftentimes it can live in the soil and grass for months, and it can be infective even while it is surviving in this environment. An individual becomes infected via inhalation, ingestion of aerosols, or by a tick bite, or through ingestion of other things like raw milk or raw cheese. So again, the spores can be inhaled or ingested by an individual. And then what happens is there's a long variable incubation period, 9 to 40 days, but on average it's about 20 days. And the Coxiella burnetti bacteria lives and multiplies in acidic vacuoles within macrophages. So when you get infected with the bacteria, your macrophages come along, engulf the bacteria, but it can't destroy the bacteria. And what happens is they get trapped in autophagosomes and autolysosomes. So they just sit within the macrophages. And because they're in this acidic vacuoles, the autophagosomes, autolysosomes, they are protected from destruction. And what's interesting about Coxiella burnetti is that it exhibits what we call an antigenic variation or phase variation. So it can go from phase one to phase two. Phase one is while it is infecting animals. So phase one is when it is very infectious. And in fact, it can infect people or animals with even just one bacterium. Phase two is when its lipopolysaccharide capsule becomes altered. And when this happens, when it's in phase two, it's non-infectious. 
So when an individual has become infected, they have gone through the incubation period, what are some of the clinical presentation or what are some of the signs and symptoms? So before I move on to signs and symptoms, I want to say that around 60% of individuals are asymptomatic. So even if they are infected, they may not produce symptoms. The other 40% can get flu-like symptoms. So what happens is that flu-like symptoms are the most common acute manifestation. It usually has an abrupt onset where it is a self-limited infection that lasts around two weeks. And it is characterized by the following. High-grade fevers, chills, sweats, usually 40 degrees Celsius, so very high fevers. And the fevers can last one to three weeks, again, maybe two-week range. Fatigue's a very common complaint with individuals. So they're very fatigued, very tired. Myalgia, so muscle aches and cramps. Headaches can be very severe with this as well, and they can get associated photophobia, so sensitivity to light. Other clinical features include the following hepatitis, so we can talk about transaminitis. Transaminitis is just elevations of liver enzymes, and the elevations in liver enzymes are generally low grade. They're usually two to three times the upper limit of normal. Hepatomegaly or an enlarged liver can occur, but jaundice does not typically occur. Liver granulomas can occur as well. So if you were to take a biopsy of one of these liver granulomas, they would have the description of donut-like. And the clinical presentation of hepatitis occurs more commonly in Europe. And another clinical presentation is where an individual comes in with pneumonia. So this typically occurs with older patients who are immunocompromised. What happens is they get a mild non-productive cough. They may have associated pleural effusion, but this is uncommon. And they have pleuritic chest pain and dyspnea. So pleuritic chest pain is when they take a deep breath and they have a pain when they take a deep breath in. Dyspnea is shortness of breath. So mild non-productive cough with some pleuritic chest pain and shortness of breath can be a common clinical scenario with regards to Q fever. And this occurs more commonly in North America. Some other clinical features include acute endocarditis. This can occur in acute or chronic Q fever. It has an autoimmune complication or component with regards to the presentation of this, and it is associated with antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Other manifestations of Q fever can include pericarditis and myocarditis, encephalitis or meningitis, and even skin rashes that are generally maculopapular in description. So again, Q fever is incredibly variable with regards to its clinical presentation, and that is just the acute clinical features. There are also chronic signs and symptoms as well, so we can have a persistent Q fever infection. It occurs in 1-5% to of patients who have Q fever. Generally, they are patients who are immunocompromised, pregnant, have prosthetic joints, or have vascular disease. And endocarditis is the most common manifestation of a chronic Q fever. And what we typically find is that if we were to draw blood cultures, they are negative. So it is a culture negative endocarditis. Cardiovascular infection can occur as well. So they can have fever, abdominal pain, weight loss. Bone and joint infections can be common. Pericardial effusions can also occur. Pulmonary interstitial fibrosis can occur. Hepatic dysfunction can occur that can even lead to cirrhosis. And the patient can be at an increased risk of amyloidosis with a chronic Q fever infection. Associated with chronic Q fever are increased risks of lymphoma and ischemic stroke just because of all of the underlying inflammatory processes occurring with a chronic Q fever infection. So as you can see, Q fever can have incredibly variable clinical presentations. That's why it is so hard to diagnose and to treat. So how do we actually do that? If we were to look at laboratory findings, some of the laboratory findings include elevated liver enzymes. We mentioned this before, two to three times upper limit of normal. We can see elevated alkaline phosphatase levels. We can see leukocytosis, so high white blood cell count. We can see thrombocytopenia and anemia of chronic disease, especially in chronic Q fever. We can see increased CPK and ESR. We can see antiphospholipid antibodies and even anti-smooth muscle antibodies. And as I mentioned before, blood cultures are usually negative because Coxiella burnetti is an incredibly difficult bacteria to culture. So how do I make the diagnosis? The diagnosis can occur through serology and indirect immunofluorescence assay. Acute infections can be diagnosed through looking at the antiphase 2. So we can see that it's greater than or equal to 1 to 200 for IgG and greater than or equal to 1 to 50 for IgM. And we follow the antiphase 2 IgG over time. This is how we follow the infection. For persistent and chronic infection, we look at a multitude of things. So these individuals might have anti-mitochondrial antibody positive, anti-smooth muscle antibody positive, and as I mentioned before, they can have antiphospholipid antibody positive all of these without a known rheumatologic disorder. And 
we can look at antiphase 1 IgG, which is greater than 1 to 800, and this is one of the due criteria for endocarditis. And phase 2 IgG is usually greater than 1 to 1600. So how do we treat it and manage Q fever? So treatment of acute Q fever can occur with the antibiotic doxycycline, and we usually use doxycycline for two weeks with an acute Q fever. We don't use doxycycline for children less than eight years old or pregnant women. And in these cases, we would use SEPTRA. For chronic Q fever, chronic Q fever is notoriously difficult to treat. So, so with a chronic Q fever, we use doxycycline and we add hydroxychloroquine to it. And we treat these individuals for at least 18 months. So these are incredibly long periods of time, so a year and a half. Or if they can't tolerate the hydroxychloroquine, we can use doxycycline and a fluoroquinolone. But if we use a fluoroquinolone, we have to treat them for three to four years. So these are incredibly long treatment periods for an individual with chronic Q fever. And the way we can tell that we have a clinical cure for Q fever is when the phase one IgG titer is less than one to the 200. And it doesn't end there. Even if we cure the Q fever, some individuals may experience what is called post Q fever fatigue syndrome. Post Q fever fatigue syndrome occurs in approximately 20% of patients. And these patients can have ongoing issues with severe fatigue, nausea, headaches, night sweats, myalgias, lymphadenopathy, arthralgias, sleeping disruption, and impaired short term memories. So even after treating Q fever, patients may have this syndrome, which can be debilitating as well. So if you want to learn more about other infectious diseases, please check out my infectious disease playlist. And if you haven't already, please consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell to help support the channel. And as always, thanks so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.